I do. Yeah, I do. Awesome. Well, as you know, we're going through the book of Acts. And the more I study the book of Acts, the more excited I get because it brings so much more meaning to the, the letters that Peter wrote, the letters that James wrote, the letters that um, Paul wrote, and the settings of where they were. And so it's really important to get the foundation. Last week we studied Acts 2.42, which many uh, Bible teachers say are the four main principles of the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread. And we actually examined that in context the whole chapter and came up with 14 characteristics of the early church. Um, so you can catch that if you want to see the recording last week. So we left off there. Um, the early church is in its formation. How, how far post-crucifixion resurrection are we? We're still in that first few months, okay? We went the first 50 days to the day of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit came upon uh, them and they spoke in languages. And remember, after that, on that day, 3,000 people were saved, baptized, saved. Probably most of them stayed in Jerusalem, were part of the assembly, but many of them went back to the over at least 15 nations that were represented there in <laughs> Jerusalem. And also remember that from the time of John the Baptist was born and Zechariah went into the temple and couldn't speak, and then a miraculous baby was born. That word went out throughout the Jewish nation. I want, we have to get this picture of what the temple was and what it meant. So today, we're going to start out in Acts 3. It says, and now Peter and John were going where? To the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. Remember, Acts tells us they were continually in the temple. It doesn't mean they were there all the time. It's a way of saying it was their regular habit to continue to go to the temple. And in the uh, there's a theology called replacement theology, where the church is replaced to Jews. The Old Testament doesn't have any significance any longer, and the temple was done away with and destroyed. Um, and that kind of it's kind of a message from Satan, and it gets all mixed into the gospel message. And it's messy. So we're going to take it one step at a time and, and look at what did the disciples actually do. Well, they were going to the to the temple at the ninth hour. Now in Ju Judaism, the hour, the day starts at zero, 6 a.m., when the sun comes up. Six at, the sixth hour is noon. The ninth hour is 3 p.m. So it's afternoon. They're going up to the temple. It's a big deal because, remember... Zechariah, uh, at, the, at the afternoon sacrifice, a priest is chosen once in his lifetime to be able to go in right next to the Holy of Holies, right next to the veil, and burn incense, which is, represents the prayers of the saints. And the, and the, the tradition or the, the legend was that that priest could pray and his prayer would be answered. And we know that Luke tells us that Zechariah was chosen by Lot when he was an old man. It means he'd never been able to do this because you're only able to burn incense once as a priest in your entire lifetime. And he went, and I can tell you what his prayer was. His prayer was for a baby, for his wife, because the angel comes and says, your prayer's been answered, your wife's going to have a baby. <laughs> and Zechariah wasn't ready for that. I mean, he knew it. He, he'd heard it could happen, but it caught him off guard. And he, he sort of goes, ah, ah, ah. Uh, the angel says, okay, you're not going to be able to speak now because you didn't embrace what I said. Well, in the meantime, the Levitical choir has sang their last song and everybody's been bowing down to worship and they're standing up and they're waiting for Zechariah to come out and he's going to um, bless the people and, and give the ironic blessing over them. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. And then that would be the conclusion of the ceremony for the day. They would fellowship on their way out and go home. Well, on this particular day, Zechariah comes out and he can't talk. 
And there's thousands of people waiting for him to give the blessing. Because he's just been as close to the presence of God as you're going to get on any day of the year except the Yom Kippur when the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies. And he can't talk. And so it's that same thing that's going on. John and Peter are going up to the temple to pray. Um, and then they're going to listen to the Levitical choir, and they're going to get the blessing, and then maybe they'll go off to Solomon's portico and do a little more teaching, maybe go to one of the homes and break bread and have a, have a meal, uh, whatever it takes. I think it's wonderful that who's going, who's partnered up here? Peter and John. How many, I can't tell you how many sermons I've heard that Peter and John didn't like each other. Because John always wrote himself, I'm the beloved disciple, and, he, and Peter always looked like the, the oaf, you know. The guy that sank when he tried to walk on water. The guy that questioned Jesus and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And the guy that cut off the ear, Jesus said, knock it off and put the ear back on. And, and the guy that denied him three times. And, and John, you know, and they had that conversation where Jesus is saying, Peter, you're going to die like a death like me. You're going to die a martyr's death. And Peter goes, well, what about him? Pointing to John. And, and, and Jesus says, if, if, if he remains and until my coming, then what is that to you? And, and so you got this idea that the two are not really best of buddies, but I, I debate that. I think they were the very best of buddies, and they're just exemplifying and, and pointing out the differences and the things that happened in their lifetime. And when it was time to go to the tomb on, on the resurrection morning, who runs ahead? John runs ahead. And we go, ah, see that? John's trying to show Peter I can run faster than you. And I don't think so. I don't think so because the, 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 the temple authorities had just arrested their master and just crucified him and they were next. And John wanted to get there first to make sure there's no troops there because if Peter shows up, they're going to arrest him and crucify him. And John says, I'm going first. It's kind of like throw yourself in front of the bus to save somebody. So I think John ran ahead for that reason. So here they are. They're going up to the temple. John and Peter. I love it. Yeah, I know you're, you're laughing. It's like the wife that said, he says, honey, you know I would uh, throw my, I'd lay down my life for you. And she says, you always say it, but you never do it. <laughs> I could see you thinking that. All right. So they're going up to the temple. That was through here. Uh, at the hour of prayer. And a certain man who had been lame from an accident, broke his leg. No, from, he was born that way. Never walked a step of his life. Maybe spinal cord injury. We don't know. Maybe malformed legs. Never had walked. A lame man. Now, could have been a blind man. Could have been any, a leper or anything else. But on this particular day, God chose to have a lame man sitting where he sat. And all this is so important, and we usually just read it through, and it makes a great children's story. Peter and John went to pray, and they met a lame man on the way, and said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I. And he went walking and leaping and praising God, and we go, that's a great story. Peter raised up the lame man. But let's look at some of the details, if we could. It's like this jigsaw puzzle. Let's keep putting the pieces in. Let's figure out where they were. The lame man from his mother's womb, that's important. He was being carried by friends, that's important. They sat down every day at the gate of the temple. Which gate? The gate which is called beautiful. Which one's that? Why is it called beautiful? In order that he could beg alms. Why is that important? And uh, from those who are entering the temple. So let's talk a little bit about where they were. Okay? Because that's a big deal. This is a drawing of possible reconstruction of the Jewish temple. Like I used to say, I used to think that they went to the temple like a hundred of them, and it was about the size of the Nazarene church, you know. But the temple could hold um, probably a million people, at least 250,000 people at once. It, it's about a, a mile to walk around it. That's the temple complex. The temple itself stood in the middle. They have this portico on the right, which is where all the merchants were, where they changed the money, and you paid your half shekel tax. And on the far side, on that whole 600 feet or 800 feet, is the portico of Solomon where the rabbis would meet and teach. And Jesus taught in the portico of Solomon, and now the disciples are teaching there too. And so you see right here on the right-hand side, those little steps going up and those three little gates, those two little gates there, those are called the hold the gates. There's three on the right, um, 
and two on the left. You can kind of see, whoops, hang on. There we go. You can kind of see them on the end here. This is the southern end of the temple. And if you go there today, I, it doesn't show the steps, but the steps are still there. The same steps that Peter and John walked up that day. And they're uneven. There'll be, there'll be a short one, and then a high step, and then a low step, and then a long step. It's like a $10 billion structure, and they couldn't build steps symmetrical. <laughs> The whole idea was that you should never rush into the presence of God. You should take your time. You should measure every step. You should examine yourself. You sh you're going into the house of the God who created the universe and he's there. And you get to go there and you're Jewish and he's your God and he's the God. And the whole world knows it. And they have got all their other gods, the Greek gods, and Zeus, and Artemis. And remember, Paul talks about that theater in Ephesus. There's like five to 10,000 people sitting there screaming, great is the goddess Ep Artemis. Well, now we got this little bitty group and they're still in the temple. This is all going on in the world and we'll get there. It's a great story when we get there about Paul and Ephesus. Um, salt and emphasis. So, but today you could go there, and this is what's left of the beautiful gate. It's, they're called the Holder Gates. There's three on the right, and then another set of two on the left. You would go into the temple through the three gates, and this is at a lower level, and you'd probably rise up about 60, 70, 80 feet and come out into the temple looking at the holy place and the holy of holies right in front of you. And then when you'd leave, you'd exit the two gates on the other side. Unless you have just lost a family member and you were mourning. And then you would enter the temple through the double gates and you'd walk against the flow of people. And every person coming out would pray for you and bless you and encourage you and say, I'm so sorry. And may you find peace here. And may God bless you. It was just a tradition of people knew that you had lost somebody and you went up that way. So that's, that's the situation. So they're going through these gates. And in 70 AD, the Romans came in and flattened. I'm going to go back just a second. They flattened everything on top. The retaining walls are still there, but everything was wiped off. Rolled over the edge. Gold picked up. People slaughtered as many as a million bodies thrown into the Valley of Gehenna. That might have some meaning. Um, and so they, that was all flat. So after 70 AD until 1967, the Six Day War, no Jewish person had access to this region. Romans built their temple on it uh, to Jupiter. They wouldn't really let the Jewish people in. And so the sages said um, that the, the world will last 6,000 years. The first 2,000 years, we had no Torah, no Bible. The next 2,000 years, we had the Word of God. And the final 2,000 years, the Messiah will reign. And you think about it, that's why the, the, the Bible makes such a big deal about he, Jesus is sitting on the throne at the right hand of God. He is reigning. He is the Messiah, he is king, he is reigning, and the nations are the footstool of his feet, and that gets repeated over and over and over in the book of Acts, because they have to know that the, the branch of David, the Messiah, is reigning for the last 2,000 years. So in 1967, um, Jewish people had reached a persecution point where they couldn't handle it anymore, and they fought back, and they dropped paratroopers into the Temple Mount and they took it and they took the center of Jerusalem and they reestablished it as a Jewish place. But it was such a holy place to the Muslims, they agreed to give it back to them if they could live in peace with one another. And, and since 1967, that's what's been going on in Jerusalem. If the Jewish people can go there, Muslims can go there, but the Jewish people can't go in down inside any of the areas. They can only walk around the perimeter. So for about a week, um, one of my teachers, David Bivin, went from the top down 
those tunnels called the Holda, through the Holda Gate. And um, he, he said it was absolutely amazing how beautiful they were. Um, they couldn't get any pictures, but they got drawings. It was the most amazing, beautiful walkway um, that you could imagine. And as far as I know, no one's been down there since, and I think they've even destroyed the, the, the set of three. The Muslims have excavated underneath the Temple Mount and dumped the dirt out. We went up on uh, the side of the Mount of Olives with our group and we sifted through the dirt for a few hours and found a coin and some pottery, things that they dug out from under that temple and dumped up there. So a lot of the heritage got put there. So anyway, they went up through this and, and, and the, the lame man is going with them. It says that, uh, and when he saw Peter and John about to go in the temple, he began asking to receive alms. And Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze upon him and said, look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do, I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. So we have a situation where it says that he's always been there, always been carried there. That would mean that a few months earlier, for whatever reason, Jesus didn't heal him because Jesus came through these same gates. That would mean for the last four or five months, they walked by him. But on this day, the Spirit of God said, today's the day. And he's lame from his mother's birth uh, womb. No one can say he was faking it because they had beggars that did that. No one can say he's not really a legitimate Triple. And Peter comes up with which hand? His right hand. And he says, look at me. I love these connections. And it really fits today because the Israelites, when they came out of Egypt, 2,000 strong, they were coming into the uh, Israel area. And this group of people group called the Amalekites attacked the back of them and they the Bible tells us that they 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 took advantage of the weak and the frail and the women and the children and they slaughtered some and they took some captive and I can't imagine the other atrocities and the tribe of Dan was supposed to be the one guarding the rear and they were also supposed to be the one these were called the Amalekites and they were also supposed to be the one that were supposed to drive out the Amalekites 40 years later, and they couldn't do it, so they went up north. And to this day, in the book of Revelation, the tribe of Dan isn't mentioned. I don't know if that's why, but I suspect it is. What I'm getting at is the territory of the Amalekites has another name today. It's called Gaza. And Moses and the Israelites are fighting the Amalekites, and as long as he raises his hand, and the people see his hands raised, they can defeat the Amalekites. But when Moses got tired and his hands went down, the Amalekites started winning. And they helped hold up his hands. And so he says, look, look at me. And he takes him by the hand and he raises him up. And Hosea 6.2 says, on, on the second day you will revive us. On the third day you will raise us up. It's a a prophetic um, term of when the Messiah comes will be raised up, will be revived. That's why the third day was an idiom for the restoration, the resurrection. And so Peter takes his hand and does that. They said, uh, Acts 3 eight says, and with a what? With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk and he entered the temple with them walking and why would it say leaping? Couldn't it just Leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Well, he's fulfilling a messianic expectation from Isaiah. It said, when Messiah comes, the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, and the lame will leap like a deer. So we're fulfilling the messianic expectation 
that the lame will leap. And I just love the fact that God uh, saved this one episode. He keeps bringing up these episodes to happen so that the people can see that Jesus was the Messiah. He did come, and we are, he is seated on his throne, and he is, the nations are under his feet. And so they, uh, they were taking note of the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple and beg alms. And um, they were filled with wonder and amazement. <clears throat> See if I can find that. Uh, and, uh, and, and amazement at what had happened to him. And while he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. So we keep hearing about this giant portico where they did the teaching, um, and uh, that's where they're all going. And when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this, or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power and piety we made this man walk? And he starts to teach them. I call this Peter's sermon. Um, he says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. He's going right back to the Old Testament, right back to Abraham, right back to the Jewish heritage. And if you haven't noticed, the authors of the Old Testament books were Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. The disciples were Jewish. And the New Testament books are Jew have, have Jewish authors. And God's purpose was to use the Jewish nation to bring in the Gentiles of the world, to save the entire world. And that's what we're setting the stage for. So lest we be, let's be careful not to do away with the Jewish people and say God gave up on them and he picked us the church to replace them. That's not the truth. He used them to be light and blessing to the world and take out the message. And right now, people are... People from every nation are right here watching this too, and they leave and they go home and they start telling these stories of what they saw. And right now there are about 12 million Jewish people in the world. There's a group of 50,000 people in Alexandria, Egypt. There's a huge group of 20 or 30,000 in Caesarea where Paul gets taken later, where, where um, uh, that, that uh, God-fearing guy, uh, that went to Peter, I <laughs> think of his name. Uh, we'll, we're getting to that in a couple of weeks where Peter had the vision of the blanket king. Cornelius, that dude. <laughs> that was a town named after him in Oregon. Cornelius was from. Anyway, there's Jewish people all over the world, millions of them. And if you remember, every man over 20 has to give a half shekel every year to go to the building of the temple. And I did a little math last night, and that's probably almost a billion dollars a year going into this temple complex. So it's a big deal. This is a big deal all over the world. The Jewish people love the temple. They love what's going on there. And, but something has happened in Jerusalem. This guy claiming to be the Messiah showed up. They crucified him. The, the rumor is that he came back to life. And this is being talked about all over. And now they're seeing these things happen by his disciples. It's really, really cool. And so Peter uh, goes through, and I think we can read through this real quick. Uh, Men of Israel, you, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. But you disowned. Who is he putting the blame on? He's telling the people that they didn't recognize the Messiah. And it's really important that we understand, because Peter's going to play on this, the Jewish people at the time believed that unintentional sin could be forgiven by sacrifices, but intentional sin could not. And where Peter's going is the Jewish leadership intentionally had him crucified. And it's going to become a big deal. So he goes on to say to these people, um, if we go on to verse uh, 17, And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance. See, you see the unintentional. So, but now what are you going to do about it? 
But the things that God announced me beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, as Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come. I didn't mention that we don't know why that gate was called a beautiful gate. But beautiful was first used for the trees in the Garden of Eden. It's a, it's a link back to it started in a garden. And John makes sure we know that there was another tree of life in a garden. And Mary mistakes Jesus for the gardener. And now they're going through the beautiful gate. And the temple's supposed to represent the restored garden. And it doesn't. And Jesus knew it. And he didn't like it. And he warned them. And they were destroyed a generation later. So at the beautiful gate... <clears throat> um, In verse 21, in whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says. You notice that verse keeps coming up. They asked John the Baptist, are you the Messiah? And he said, no. Are you the prophet? No. That's the one that in Deuteronomy they said, I'm going to raise up a prophet like you from among your people. It was a messianic prophecy about Jesus. And they keep bringing that up. But what's important, what it says, that Peter says, and it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among his people. Peter draws this line. Jesus was that prophet that God said he would raise up like Moses, and everyone who doesn't believe in him will be utterly destroyed. Not just just temporarily punished or whatever, but utterly destroyed. And I looked that term up, and it always means, all through the Old Testament, completely destroyed, completely destroyed, completely destroyed. So there's salvation in no other name. Peter's going to tell, going to mention later, there's no other name under heaven by which you must be saved. But those who deny him as Messiah will be utterly destroyed. And likewise, the prophet spoke, and it goes on to say, um, they were speaking, but as they were speaking to the uh, people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees came up to them, and being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming Jesus, we're into Acts chapter 4 now, the resurrection from the dead. Remember, they didn't, the Sadducees didn't believe the resurrection of the dead, so it's really bugging them. Because they got to do something about this Messiah guy that they say was resurrected from the dead. And we don't believe in that, so it couldn't happen. But there he was, but so how do we explain this? So what are we going to do about it? And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day because it was already evening. That confirms the time of the day, right? But many of those, I love this part, they're not there to have an altar call now. They're in jail, right? They, the, 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 uh, the Capitol Police came to arrest them and carried them off to jail. And what happens? But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. It's happening. It's happening. So far, all Jewish, primarily. And on the third day, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, was there in Caiaphas, and John, Alexander, everyone of high priestly descent, when they placed them in the center. Do you realize what's going on here? This is like Tracy and Jurgen healing a, a lame man and then proclaiming Jesus and in Washington, D.C., and the Capitol Police arrest you, and the next day you're taken before the Supreme Court, and there's the 12 justices, and the president and vice president and Secretary of State come in, and you're sitting in front of all of them. That's what's going on here. This, this is a big deal. These two disciples from Galilee are in front of the Sanhedrin, 70 elders that are going to this full court, pulled up overnight. And the first thing they, that we're, we know from the, the history is when, when there's a healing, their job was to determine, did God heal a person, or did Satan heal a person, or was it sorcery? And so the first thing they ask them is, how was this person healed? So it's like they're, they're, um, they're working on it. So they are arrested. Um, 
and they're taken in in all uh, shortness, but I, I encourage you to go back and read it. They said, by what power or in what name have you done this? And when they heard this, uh, they lifted their voice. 24. There's an extra page here. We're not going to be able to read all these. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit of a, <coughs> to a sick man as to how the man was made well, let it be known that it was done by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. So what did he say? Whom you crucified. He's talking to the Supreme Court and the President. And he's telling them, you committed an intentional sin and there's no forgiveness for that and you're going to burn in hell because of it. This is kind of a big deal. And in the meantime, in Solomon's portico, there's 5,000 men that are saying, I believe in Jesus. He's the Messiah. I see it. And they go through this trial and they don't know what to do with them. So they tell them, all right, we're going to let you go. But quit talking about Jesus. <laughs> and remember, they were concerned about Jesus because they had, they had this guy named Judas, a different one from Iscariot, and a guy named Thaddeus, and this Egyptian that all tried to start rebellions, and Rome came in and squashed them, wiped them out, killed every one of them. They're just a little nervous about this Jesus guy because he rode a donkey in, and there was several thousand people waving palm, palm branches and claiming that he's their king. And if Rome gets, we have, and they said, we have no king but Caesar. And if Rome gets word of this, what are they going to come in and do? <coughs> they're going to wipe them out. So they're still concerned <coughs> that there's this uprising going on and Rome's not going to like it and they don't know what to do about it. And they're all multi-billionaires because of it and they don't want to lose their position. I think we kind of see that in politics today. There's a lot of money goes around when there's a war and when things are going on and a lot of personal benefit from things, a lot of corruption. And that's exactly what we have. It's said that the, the temple, the, the high priest and the, and, the, and the temple aristocracy was like the mafia. Annas was like the godfather and his, his son-in-law Caiaphas married Annas' daughter and it's just a big corrupt system and here, here we are but it's in the temple that God was always in. But now all of a sudden the lights are going out. The, the lamps that always stay lit are going out at night. The doors that they would shut at night are coming open. The veil got ripped and you can see that nothing's in the Holy of Holies. But they're still going on. It's like the emperor's new clothes. You know, he's naked, but nobody wants to tell him that veil's been ripped. They're repairing it. They don't have it back up. But that Holy of Holies is empty and God's not there. And yet they're still pretending that everything's right. And I think that's kind of where I want to go with that today. Which camp are we in? What is it that has crippled us for a long time? And we've just been content to live with that handicap. And yet God wants to take us by the hand and say, look at me. And he wants to raise us up, and he wants to restore us, and he wants to show his power. And it, it said, Peter, in a sermon to the trial, said, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If you're going to memorize the verse, that should maybe be one of them. And earlier said, and it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And that may mean eternally, or that may mean 70 AD, when Rome does come in and, just, and destroy the, the area. But um, to end this, it says, when they had prayed, the place where they gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Mm -hmm. And I guess that would be my prayer that in some way, as we study this, as we realize what went on, that in some way we're shaken. Mm -hmm. Wait for the 
the building is shaking. It's not doing it. That's good. <laughs> but in some way, we're shaken. We're shaken out of that daily routine that we've fallen into. We're shaken out of being bogged down every day by whatever bumps us out. We're, we're shaken. And because of that, we can speak, uh, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak the Word of God with boldness. I love what Tracy said. It's wrong when they, when they don't support Israel, when they support the terrorists that, that, uh, that killed the father, raped the mother, and then put the baby in the oven and made the mother listen to the baby scream. That's wrong to support that. That's what the Amalekites did. That's the evil that was here. That's the evil that God had to destroy the earth the first time with the flood. That's the evil that Satan represents. That's who he is. He's a liar, a thief. And I see a huge portion of our nation and the world supporting that. And, and it's a spiritual battle. The line has been drawn. <clears throat> And I just pray that God will give us all an extra measure of his Holy Spirit and we can speak the word of God boldly because it's time. I actually went on uh, travel Aussie to see if, how, if it's possible to fly into Israel now, and it is, but it's $7,000 for a ticket. But I would actually like to be there right now because there's nobody I couldn't talk to about Jesus because they would get it. The restoration of all things. The Messiah is on the throne. He is in charge. And he is the reason that all the people on earth would be blessed. That's what uh, God was saying to Abraham. Through you, all the people on earth will be blessed. Those that bless you will be blessed. Those that curse you will be cursed. Because Jesus was the offspring and lineage of Abraham. And he blessed the whole world. And those that don't see it, those that choose not to see it, are going to be like the high priesthood who are worried that they might lose what they have or not gain enough or for whatever reason. So there's no other name under heaven than given by which we must be saved. And I wish I was there right now because rather short of, a, of an escalation of world war, Israel is a very safe place to be unless you're right next to Gaza right now. But... Just the idea, if you think about it, if you are parents in Israel, your kids are in Gaza right now because every child serves in the military. Every son serves three years, every daughter serves two years. And it's a whole generation of capable people. There was one brigade of just young women, and I think there was 20 some of them, and they killed over 100 terrorists on that morning. This one girl that led them killed five herself. It's terrible that we have to live in that <coughs> environment, but it's wonderful that they are standing up and training the young people to fight the enemies of God. And that's the world we're in. I just pray, God, that we will be shaken in some way and we can speak the word of God with boldness. Amen. Amen. So, from here, the word is going to go out and we get to go with it. And we're going to watch. And next week, we're going to... Look at Ananias and Sapphira. What the heck? They didn't give it all and they died? And then, wait a second, they, no one had any need and they had all things in common, but yet we got widows that aren't getting food? And then we have to have deacons and what's that all about? And what's going on in Jerusalem and what? what? And then we get to Stephen. He's one of the seven. And Paul's holding the robes while they're stoning Stephen. It's going to get really fun. <laughs> it's going to get really fun and it's important that we take it step by step and we look at it all the way through and then we're going to go with Paul everywhere Paul goes we're going we're going to learn about the cities we're going to learn about who was there we're going to learn about the message and if you'll notice he almost always goes to the synagogue first and then we'll learn about Peter and that vision and the sheet and Cornelius and, and Philip goes to Samaria and Philip goes to to uh the eunuch, and then he goes to Caesarea, and yeah, just a lot of cool stuff we're going to get to, so. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit. Lord, shake us. Shake us and give us boldness to speak your word.
shake your church everywhere in the world, the two billion people that belong to your church because of what Jesus Christ did and the word went out. Shake us all and give us all boldness to speak the word. Bless Israel, protect them, heal the hearts, heal the wounded. Please bring about quick resolution of this and allow them to defeat your enemies. God, please send your spirit with each one of us today. Give us boldness, excitement, and peace. In Jesus' name, amen.